I'm uh, speaking with uh, Ron Heron, visiting from London here at SciArc the uh, spring semester of 1982. And uh, as I said, we're really glad uh, to have you here. I thought it would be a nice opportunity to have a chat, as you would say. Um, something that we haven't done exactly like this, you Not and I. Not quite like this, no. And uh, I thought it might be interesting to go back a ways and see what things were like when you were starting out, what, what the uh, ambiance was like in London, what the influences might have been on you as a young man mm -hmm. okay. starting out. Well, I, I have a rather strange background. Uh, I left school at 16, uh, having been to school to learn joinery, carpentry, mm. uh, and I found I had no aptitude for, for carpentry. I could never make things fit. Uh, things always collapsed on me. And they, uh, at the school, this was a school of uh, building, mm. building technology, um, they, one of the uh, teachers there suggested that maybe I should attempt uh, uh, an, the architectural course. And I did a, a, a two-year, as it were, pre-architecture course in, in the building school, uh, which was very interesting. And I found uh, that this uh, I enjoyed doing. Uh, it was new to me. I, I hardly knew what the word architect meant, uh, I think, before I started. Um, I then found uh, a job at 16 in an architect's office, mm. thinking that I'd be a draftsman. Uh, and I worked in this office, a very, very nice man, a royal academician, uh, with a small office, and I did everything. Uh, it was this guy and me. I was the typist and the draftsman, mm. telephone operator. I made the coffee. Uh, and because of that, he gave me things to do. He, he was like a father to me. Uh, taught me a lot. Uh, let me run jobs. I ran my first job at 17, uh, which was no major architectural commission, but uh, was interesting. And then uh, at 18, uh, there was national service, and I went into the Air Force. Uh, the most boring two years of my life in the Air Force, uh, in air traffic control. And when I came out, uh, I decided that I liked architecture, and I dis uh, that there must be a way I could be an architect instead of a draftsman. Uh, so I went to evening school. I worked in an architect's office mm. uh, and went to evening school. Uh, I had a, a teacher who taught, uh, worked at the GLC, the then uh, London County Council. Yes. Very interesting man uh, who somehow saw something in what I was doing that interested him. And he offered me a job in the GLC, which was quite extraordinary. I was completely unqualified. And I sat on a, a board. Uh, they invited 40 applicants to attend uh, 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 an interview. Uh, and they were, all the other applicants were qualified architects. And I got the job. Um, I, I'm sure it was this guy who uh, gave me the job. Okay. <laughs> um, and from there, uh, the GLC, uh, this was in uh, 19, uh, I would guess 1951. Mm. Uh, I was 21, uh, and the uh, place was one of the few offices in England that had really interesting architects. Uh, they all, the Smithsons were there, or, or just left there actually. Uh, Alan Cahoon, uh, Sandy Wilson. Uh, or a couple of my own friends, Warren Chalk, uh, and uh, it was an education. It was like going to the best school in mm -hmm. the country. Um, and through people like Warren uh, and continuing uh, the uh, evening school, uh, we uh, used to attend the independence group uh, evenings at the ICA, and mm -hmm. I found heroes in people like, obviously, like Le Corbusier, um, I discovered him at 15. I'd found a book in the library. Um, and uh, Pelotzi. Uh, do you, oh, do you want to talk a little bit about the independence group? What yes, that was it, going on in London at that time? They, uh, they were, uh, uh, there was a, um, 
a venue called the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. I'm, I'm no authority on this, but uh, uh, it was a gallery and discussion place. It had a small restaurant. It still exists. Mm -hmm. And it was in Dover Street. Uh, there were some amazing people that uh, went there, people like Palazzi and Hamilton and Alloway and Bannum and the Smithsons, uh, all the young architects of the period, this, this, the people that were called brutalists, I think, at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. A mixture of artists Art, and architects. Architects, television people, uh, writers, so young, musicians. Young creative people. Yes. And they, uh, at this, uh, this time, were looking for uh, some sort of interaction between one another, and they organized evenings. There were, there were exhibitions they did, were quite um, famous exhibitions in, in the sort of European scene. But the evenings were quite extraordinary. I mean, the one memorable evening was uh, with Perlozzi, who's a sculptor, very famous sculptor, great friend now. Um, and he uh, came one evening with a collection of two or three hundred slides. And these slides, this is in early 50s, were of popular imagery. And he was showing this to uh, intellectual uh, people, architects, and so on. Uh, and it was uh, imagery out of uh, advertising, out of the movies, uh, out of science fiction, and uh, the sort of juxtaposition of art and popular imagery. It was the first time I'd sort of associated pop culture mm -hmm. with art. Uh, and the, the amazing thing, because it, it meshed absolutely with my own view. Uh, and it was quite an extraordinary experience, too suddenly someone talking about things you've been thinking mm -hmm. and didn't mm -hmm. dare mm -hmm. bring into the conversation because so it, it was sort of junk. So it stuff. encouraged well, that sure. kind of idea. Sure. sure. Um, so they, they had these amazing evenings. They did a, uh, a very good exhibition called This Is Tomorrow. I would guess this was in 1954, 55, mm. uh, in the Whitechapel Gallery. Um, and this was uh, a collaboration between groups of architects and artists, and they made a construction each, uh, and an installation in the gallery. Uh, and again, some of those installations included robots, mm. uh, from the movies, of course, because they weren't real. Um, amazing things with light, jukeboxes, rock music, early rock music. Um, and as well as very elegant architectural pieces by uh, Peter Carter and people like this. Uh, and the collaboration between artist and architect was quite interesting in, in some cases. In some cases it was uh, 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 the artist working within an architectural context and sometimes the two things meshed, so the art and the architecture were the same. Uh, and sometimes the they were neither art nor architecture, but were to do with communication. Uh, this was, again, early McLuhan and, mm -hmm. and so on. And, and th there was an one of the other impressions I have of that show was a uh, very famous uh, Ham Richard Hamilton collage uh, called, uh, I forget, something like uh, um, what makes uh, today's environment so beautiful and so lovely. And it was popular imagery. But it, it uh, uh, made me think about collage as a means mm -hmm. of presenting architectural work. This is as well as seeing things that Mies had done and so on. But, so that they, those people were very, very influential. And uh, I think uh, the Smithsons, particularly in the architectural world, had uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, strong influence, uh, and they were writing a lot at that time in the English architectural press. Uh, although they were never my teachers, they were my teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By association. Sure. It sounds like it was really a, 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 a tailor-made environment in, yes. the, in which you could test your ideas. Well, it was a very strange way to move into architecture. I mean, I wouldn't advise anybody to, to go about it that mm -hmm. way. It was sort of... Uh, uh, educationally sort of uh, strange, uh, but it, it seems to have suited me uh, uh, perfectly. Uh, Did the Archigram group form out of that? 
period? Um, well, Warren uh, Chalk, who one of the original members of the group, was a great friend, and um, we've been friends nearly 30 years. Uh, and we worked together at GRC and did a lot of competitions. Um, and Dennis Crompton was working with us as well as the third member of the group. Uh, and we were working, there was a young Indian boy working with us um, on the South Bank project. And he was a friend of Peter Cook's and David Green's, who are the other two, two of the other members of the group. And they had already produced one issue of Akiram magazine, which we'd seen. And they'd seen some work that we produced uh, for a competition and asked us to write some stuff for the second. And so we met them this way, um, very casually and quite by chance. Um, and we had no thoughts of it being a group. I mean, it was these two strange guys doing a magazine. Uh, and we were interested in talking about the ideas we had. Um, but it was soon after that um, I left the GLC to join a guy called Theo Crosby, who was then editor of Architectural Design, or technical editor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd uh, asked me to join him on a huge project in central London. And when we were building the team, we pulled in what became the Archigram Group, um, because they were people that interested me. And I had that opportunity of pulling these people together. So that, that's really, uh, and then from there on it was uh, quite natural. We became great friends, and when Archigram 3 was thought about, um, uh, the, the six of us uh, put this thing together, um, and it, it sort of grew out of that. The, we did an exhibition soon after that, uh, in 64, where, uh, at the ICA, funny enough, where um, we did, uh, we had an idea about uh, the city, and we did an exhibition called Living City. Uh, and because the group were producing the magazine, and we just did the uh, sort of science fiction uh, Archigram 4, which was called Zoom, the Zoom issue. Uh, and it, Bannum had uh, fed this uh, to Peter Blake here and Forum magazine. So suddenly the magazine became known mm -hmm. Went around the world, uh, outside of mm -hmm. the English schools mm -hmm. because we, our students used to sell it for us on <laughs> at other schools. Right. We were teaching. And uh, so the exhibition opened and uh, people w wanted to call us something and people in the press, I don't know who did it first, but the press started to refer to us as the Archigram group or the Archigram crowd. Or, mm -hmm. And, and it was easier to just keep that uh, later mm -hmm. when we, we were designing things together. Mm -hmm. Up till then we hadn't, you see, it had been projects that one or two of us, mm -hmm. I did a lot of projects with Warren, um, that were in the magazine, but we'd, the, this exhibition was the first thing we did as a group of people. Um, and then this label stuck from there on. And it was easier to keep it. Mm -hmm. Seemed appropriate. Yes, there was no, no, there was never a sort of formal thing. Let us be a group. Yes, yes. It just happened it was quite probably naturally. Better that way. Sure. Um, <laughs> and it, it's it's quite extraordinary because uh, you you meet five five other guys uh, who have very similar interests, um, but 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 uh, in some respects push your thinking on as well. So because they have slightly different interests. And it was quite extraordinary meeting five people that had, you know, a similar attitude to things uh, uh, that was so peculiar because we were all interested in things outside of architecture as well. Um, space program, science fiction, literature, American literature, I should say, movies, uh, communication, uh, and wanted to fuse these things. And this, uh, uh, as young guys, this great belief that the world out there didn't have to be as bad as it was environmentally and visually, mm -hmm. uh, and that we could do it better. So, I mean, it's a sort of young man sort of view of, of that. Posit I still believe that. Of course. Great, that's <laughs> great. It was, uh, I was going to say, positive, upbeat kind of thinking that sure. uh, really was characterized in what sure. you were doing. Sure. How was the reception at home? 
to uh, your ideas? Well, it was uh, at first, uh, the, the stab well, at first, forever, <laughs> the establishment in England uh, uh, saw us uh, as, as um, people that were, had strange ideas, that weren't quite architects, um, that uh, were really dealing in a sort of science fiction fantasy world that was silly and irrelevant which is a sort of uh, a way of uh, protecting yourself. I think most, most architects want to uh, form ideas that they can then spend the rest of their lives doing, producing. And they're very nervous of, of someone coming along and saying, well, wait a minute, can't you think of it in another way? Because that sort of knocks the ground from under your feet. Um, and so the establishment take, mm -hmm. always take that, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's there as a protection, they, they sort of sneer at you and so on. Um, but, but on the, the world scene, Well, uh, again, though, there was in the great student... Interest. Well, the st we were teaching, and uh, the... Uh, it, it's, it's difficult to be objective about it, but we had amazing uh, support from the student population. I remember we did a lecture at the RIBA. It was a classic uh, occasion. I don't know what year, 66. And uh, it was an evening lecture that usually got an audience of 20. And we arrived uh, with our six projectors and 12 screens and sound systems. As usual. <laughs> uh, and they gave us a room that was sort of 40 feet by 30. Uh, and within this an hour before we, we were trying to set it up, the room was full. And there were coachloads arriving <laughs> from Liverpool and all over the country. We publicised it, you see, uh -huh, okay. <laughs> and And uh, they had to move us into the main hall. Wonderful. And we filled the hall, and they then had to uh, televise it on, on the room outside mm -hmm. and broadcast mm -hmm. the sound. Mm -hmm. And it was right, and there were these six old gentlemen sitting in the front <laughs> who always attended these things. And because in those early days, we, we uh, although we were drawing uh, and producing uh, schemes rapidly, uh, you never had enough uh, staff to talk about. Um, so you were always having to use analogy uh, to, to, to make a six screen, whatever that is, uh, 500, 600 slide presentation um, uh, with film and so on. I mean, the amazing uh, sort of juxtaposition of things. And because the, the, I, I think it was the first time Marilyn Monroe appeared at the RIBA <laughs> on screen. And these guys didn't understand this. <laughs> And it, it was quite amusing because the uh, the students then brought uh, rattles, you know, the football rattles, and uh, there was great cheers and noise. <laughs> great. And the idea never, and they never reported it. <laughs> uh, they tended to ignore it completely. And it, it, I think that I guess we've got older and we've become more respectable, but the RIBA still has a slight uh, feeling that we're not really uh, involved in the same business. Mm. Somehow. But I think worldwide, it, it, um, uh, it, 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 uh, again, we had, uh, from students particularly, um, and from schools throughout, I mean, we, we were traveling amazingly uh, from about 1966 into Europe. Mm -hmm. um, Warren was here in, I think, as early as 66, 67, and I came over for two years in 68. So that, um, and we taught uh, universities, um, uh, ju just talking uh, about these ideas, uh, and uh, and met the same sort of reaction. I mean, uh, an establishment that thought it was sort of strange and uh, a strong st student following, I guess. In particular, the school we taught at, which is the Architectural Association. Um, and, and, and it, they, they, I think at one stage, people internationally thought we ran the school because <laughs> it was so pervasive. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that uh, your ideas were very influential in those years. And actually, uh, many of your uh, project ideas were finally put into sure. uh, the real world by other people, sure. very often influenced. Uh, by you, like such as the World's Fair sure. buildings and so sure. forth. Sure. No, there, I think there were uh, the, yes, the things 
the the idea of uh, of, of an environment in change, uh, the clip-on changeable environment, yes, was certainly there. But it, I mean, I find it uh, actually uh, very amusing now to watch this. I mean, we were talking about this yesterday here, um, the sort of TV ads now, and you you see the robots making the cars for Fiat. And, you know, the, this ad about was it? What is it? Uh, uh, handmade by robots or something, mm. this sort of line. Um, and we were talking about robotics and people were saying stupid. <laughs> um, and uh, it's here. Mm -hmm. and you, I mean, I saw an ad in a magazine two days ago here for a $200 robot that uh, you can buy. Mm. I should probably buy one. <laughs> that would be appropriate. Yes. So I think a lot of those things uh, uh, I don't. I don't think we were invent. I mean, we certainly weren't inventing those things. But it, it was uh, trying to bring them into the architectural conversation. Um, it seems to me that those things are much more relevant than Palladio in any architectural conversation today, uh, or certainly as relevant. Um, and it seems strange that they don't come into the conversation. Well, they must. Uh, I think they have to. Uh, I think any architect who uh, tries to ignore the present is a fool. Uh, and, and to sort of move back in history seems an uh, extraordinary waste of, of time uh, at the level that it, it currently is, uh, is, is going, um, where people are so uh, intent on going backwards, uh, there'll be a building. Stonehenge very shortly, I think. Mm, you're you're um, <coughs> uh, anticipating my next question. I was going to uh, pursue that a little bit about you know how it feels, what's going on today, mm -hmm. and and how how you uh, react to some of the things that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, I was having a conversation last night with a friend, uh, and he asked me what I found interesting today. And I, I had to admit nothing in the architecture world. I find the things that interest me, <laughs> funny enough, are, are historical, uh, but recent history. I, for instance, find uh, Charo still very interesting. Mm -hmm. I find Corbusier still very interesting. Um, I find uh, uh, Mies marginally interesting. Uh, I find early Wright very interesting, Adolf Luce extraordinary, and so on. Um, uh, and uh, I, I really have no interest in, interest in the, the sort of current uh, sort of wave of, of, of looking back and copying. I think those men would have been absolutely amazed. Uh, I think Wagner in Vienna if he was to see, I know at the AA where I teach uh, students, go to Vienna and you say to them, look at this man, marvelous post office building, see. And uh, they seem not to be able to see it without seeing it and copying it, uh, without sort of understanding. And I'm sure if Wagner was to see these projects that are so Wagner, that Wagner could have done them, he, he would be disgusted. Uh, uh, he with, would with like the to state see of things Africa. further along. Of course he would, which is what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think is what all those guys were doing. I think Palladio would take the same view. <laughs> you know, 300 years on, why are they still doing this? Uh, and I must take that That's view. That's a great line. I love mm. it. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem we have. Well, Palladio in Los Angeles is really questionable when we have That's opportunity true. to do anything in the world here. Sure. Well, Palladio in Italy is also questionable. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. Yes. No, I think it's uh, it's an easy route, and uh, I think that a lot of the problem uh, again uh, this evening we were talking about this um, the the uh, way the historian is is suddenly no longer writing history; he's trying to write about the future, and the historian can't operate that way. And I think this is one of the dangers with the, this moment. Uh, the historian is trying to direct uh, architectural thinking uh, and he should stick to his job and try and look at history and uh, 
understand the past. And I think these guys are so wrapped up in bringing out the next book mm. uh, twice right. a year. Right. Uh, and that promoting they, it with and the promoting lectures. It, sure. That they, uh, they do, they're no longer doing their job. And I am really not interested uh, in historians' view of uh, the direction we're going. I think he's the last person that understands such things. Well, it seems to be so self-serving. Sure, sure. There are very few people commenting today, it seems to me, who have any kind of broad perspective. Yes. That's what we're lacking. I yes, think. I, think, I think that's uh, certainly in architecture. Um, uh, I would guess in other fields, uh, you, you, uh, ah, you could yes, say. Okay. Uh, in architecture, I think that's so. Uh, I think um, um, it, it is difficult. I, I, I mean, you, 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 as an Englishman, you, you tend to end up having to uh, say Bannum. And, and, and I know Bannum's uh, disappeared into California, and we never hear a lot of him other than when I see him. But, um, he's writing. I think he's starting to good. put uh, out more. And he uh, was uh, uh, at that level of, of, of uh, historian, of, uh, of, of the lecturer and so on, was operating well. And I think there's some great guys. Uh, there's a, um, a guy whose name I can't remember uh, at Toronto, um, Alan Brooks. Oh, yes. Uh, who, for me, is a historian. I mean, he's writing a book currently, currently, he's been writing it for eight years, on Corb's teenage years. And I don't know, he's taken two sabbaticals, to my knowledge. Ah, we ran into him in 79. Right. He was living at the Villa La Roche. That's right. And he was doing his research That's there. That's right. Using the Corbusier archives. That's right, he's working wonderful. in the archive. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he's uh, what I think of as a historian. He's reading stuff, and it's may be rather dry and not popular uh, literature that he produces, but it's well-researched uh, and scholarly. And this book of his, he told me, we were with him this summer, uh, that it will be, he, he just finished the proofreading, mm. and he wanted a second read uh, through the proofs, and he thought it'd be out in 18 months. So I like the, the stretch of time there, somehow it seems right. And, and I'm sure it would be an important book. Mm. And I'm sure there are a lot of people like that who uh, are, are solidly working and researching. And it seems to me that's, that's what the historian's mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a lot of the people currently who uh, pose under that guise are, are journalists, really. What are you doing now that interests you? Currently? Um, I. Uh, well, you know most of my projects, which have been to do with uh, um, uh, the, the fascination with uh, movie sets and uh, the idea of architecture as set, uh, simulation, uh, holography, uh, all those amazing architectural elements that nobody uses. Um, and I'm currently, I've got a dream job in England for a theme park, uh, which is an electronic theme park on a thousand acres. And uh, I can't tell you how amazing it is. Now, whether it will actually happen, I'm working on feasibility at the moment. I'm about eight weeks into it, ten weeks into it. Seems like an appropriate project. And it's, it's a dream. If I was, were to have sat down and described the job, I, it would have been this job. Uh, it, it's uh, a lot of people will say it doesn't deal with the issues of today, but it seems to me that uh, it, it, it's things like the the exhibition, um, uh, the Weisenhofs and and so on. Uh, certainly this century, and Crystal Palace uh, mm -hmm. last century, um, that uh, have allowed architects to move into these new worlds and to examine an experiment, and that's what I want to do. Um, and I'm quite happy for all the historicists to carry on as they are, <laughs> as long as I don't have to get involved. Oh, good. I hope that goes ahead. That would be great. Uh, well, I think uh, it has every chance. Uh, it's got very good backing. Um, 
politically as well by government mm. and the EEC in Europe. Um, and so I'm hopeful that there'll be a, a sort of major plan put together by the end of August this year. Um, and a sort of costing and, uh, and sort of marketing strategy for the thing. So it is exciting and it, I've, it's also the opportunity to work with amazing people. Um, we, we have consultants such as uh, Monty Python. Oh, um, great. Uh, and sort of movie animators and uh, electronics firms and, and so on. And I, I'm hopefully we'll be able to bring in um, a number of other architects. It's such a huge scheme mm. that uh, you, uh, you couldn't hope to do it all. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to bring in other people, uh, particularly some of my friends uh, from Archeogram and people like Cedric Price, uh, who are absolutely made for this sort of job. Where is the site? It's in the centre of England, uh, yeah. near Northampton. Uh, rather badly located uh, from sort of no road networking, but again, that's part of the study. Uh, there's a sort of planning strategy uh, and transport strategy for connecting it into the network. It, it's got, uh, I forget the figures now, it's got a, um, a, a plan, as you use a word, uh, a catchment area of uh, some 20 million, apparently. Mm. I never understand those things. And <laughs> I take their word for that. <laughs> what do you see coming? I wish I knew. I, uh, <laughs> I, I could make a fortune. Or what possible. would you like to see come? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, I would hate to see uh, a situation where uh, the things I am in, in, interested is all that happened. I think it'd be very boring. And I think our environment, um, yeah, I, I, I do believe in change. Um, and I believe in lots of points of view. Um, and I think it's that richness of view uh, that makes the environment, uh, or makes the environment possibly better than it is. Um, and so I'd like to see that continue. And I'd like to see things, uh, people do things beautifully and with thought and care. Uh, the care for people as well, of course, uh, but care for the object. Um, you know, I, I guess in the end, uh, you know, one goes to a place like, I don't know, Ranchon, and it, I, it really doesn't matter to me that it's a church or whatever, it's, it's a beautiful place. Uh, and one goes to um, a TV studio, and it's also a beautiful place. <laughs> Uh, and I'd like to see that rich mix, which it, I mean, inevitably will continue. But I mean, I, I suppose the, the one thing I would like is to be able to do some of those things that I want to do uh, and see if they do work. I hope you do get that opportunity and, yeah. and we'll be anxious to hear about it. And uh, I thank you for coming and uh, speaking with me and uh, we'll look forward to the next time. Mm -hmm. I'm talking uh, with Peter Cook this afternoon, the first week of April, 1981. Peter has been visiting with us at SciArc, and I thought, that we should take advantage of the opportunity to have a, a conversation where we might touch on some of the things that uh, one doesn't have time to cover during uh, a formal public lecture. Uh, of course, when we think of Peter Cook, we think of Archigram. Uh, you're having been one of the main founders of the group. The Archigram group had such a strong impact on the world, I think I could say, um, all of us during the 60s. Um, it, it makes me wonder what it was like for you during that period when you first started, what you were dealing with and what the climate was like in London. I think the climate in London at the time and the incentive for making Archigram 
was very much of mainstream architecture. Most of us had studied with some really exciting younger, then younger, English architects. And um, we came out and went into offices and discovered that the scene was very straight and dreary. I think the first flush of enthusiasm after the war of an earlier generation had quietened down and people were into building lots of schools and office blocks and so on and so on. And so we started Archigram as a kind of almost a protest sheet, but a protest sheet that wanted to carry on the conversations which we'd been having as students. And um, it was done in order to upset and irritate as much as to be a vehicle for the promotion of <coughs> certain ideas and certain projects. And I think at that time, even magazines like AD were fairly mainstream. So that's its context. But also I think that <coughs> some of us within the group have been very conscious of the 20th century tradition of pamphleteering and making exhibitions and broadcasting and exchanging theoretical ideas in architecture, not just talking about buildings as built. And so it had that as its context. <coughs> and in this connection, I would say that we've been very conscious of ourselves being in a direct historical line. In England, it would have been impossible for us to have done Archigram without the example of people like Smithson. I think they're very important. I think Smithsons and a, a group of uh, art architects and artists called the Independent Group, who had made an exhibition called This Is Tomorrow. I mean, they were a generation older than us, but they had blazed a trail which we were, in a sense, able to follow and then define our own territory. And what came out of that then was, quite quickly, a, a kind of international mafia of experimental groups particularly in Japan and in Austria. I would name those two countries as being the most uh, avant-garde at the point, say, in the mid and late 60s. And there was very quickly a kind of curious, uh, not only fellow feeling, but a, a curious link in terms of the kinds of projects being made in and around Vienna and in and around Tokyo and in and around London. And so that's an interesting aspect of it, if, you, if one takes sort of the cultural history of the period. Do you feel that the Japanese put some of your ideas into direct practice by some of the things that oh, were built surely, there? yes. And of course I, th I think that one has to then regard uh, abstracted ideas and theoretical ideas and avant-garde ideas vis-a-vis -vis the mainstream of architecture. I personally find it distasteful to think of um, the territories of architecture being separated. I think that it is all too convenient for some people to say, oh, well, he is a theoretician, or he is a pedagogue, or he is a drawer, or he is a builder, or he is a sort of uh, small-scale architect, or he is an urbanistic architect, or so on. I think that the, 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 the ground has to be constantly maintained between these territories. And I can only regret that, that um, we haven't built very much not so much for only from the point of view of wanting to see, you know, that building is the ultimate end. I think that all the rest is merely support mechanism. But that the, the feedback that one gets from the actual built thing is necessary to the development of the theory. But equally, I think the development of the theory is very important to particularly the atmosphere of offices. I think that all too many people who go just into professional practice who go into an office talk within a narrow and narrower group of people and you and you meet you meet quite you know quite often you meet somebody who was really bright as a student or whatever or as a teacher who has then spent say five years in an office doing buildings and their, their conversations have narrowed it's as, as if their thinking process has stopped at the moment when they stopped contact with uh, an academy and that's why um, I have not total regret that I've spent so much time teaching, um, particularly at the A, which is a city school in the sense that the majority of people are doing something outside. I think it's very, and, and that's why I rather like the atmosphere of this school, where everybody 
so it would seem on the staff, is involved in some other activity outside, primarily in building. And you're very lucky to have here the possibility that, that particularly your younger faculty are able to be building at least some sort of beach hut with a few postmodern details on it, or whatever <laughs> the hell it might be. But, uh, you know, at least there's something coming out that... that uh, and I think that is the advantage that a, that a school in a metropolitan condition has. Unfortunately, in London, I think that we've had far less opportunity to dabble around at small scale. Um, and that makes one very frustrated when one comes here. Ah, yes. But I digress a little. No, no, it's all right. I, I have feelings about that, too. I think we're very lucky to have opportunity here, whereas in Europe and in England, it's, it's much more built up and the mm -hmm. opportunity is less frequent. And also, you're able to build... Uh, I don't say more cheaply overall, but at, at least the climate and the accepted building construction method means that little sort of experimental toys, as I would call them, can be made, whereas in Europe, uh, you know, just the climate is different and the demands made by the building codes are different and, and so on. And there isn't so much room to experiment. And so that's another area of frustration. I come here looking around and, and seeing your lucky faculty, how they are in a... Throwing things up left and right. Throwing things <laughs> up, at least more than, than any of us are able to. Yes, yeah. You mentioned teaching at the AA. You've, mm -hmm. you've taught there for many years, haven't you? Yes, I think it's now nearly 16 years. And Ron Heron also, and Dennis oh, Crompton. Right, yes, the whole gang have been there at some time. Around. Most all of you have gone into education, haven't you? Yes, I think so. Um, I think what starts as, as a kind of means to facilitate other things ends up by being virtually a career, which of course has its own dangers. I think that it's extremely difficult, not only difficult, but it's extremely questionable to be a career academic in architecture. I think that the nature of architecture, since it is not a precise academic discipline, uh, doesn't, doesn't benefit from career academics. I think it is essentially, an, to some extent, uh, an empirical pursuit, and to some extent a pursuit that depends upon a, a mixture and a feedback from the discussion of the abstract to the discussion of the particular. And I think so in the same person. I think that, that to me, the kind of German professor syndrome, in, in some aspects, is almost the ideal, where it is expected of the German professor that he builds, it's expected of him that he spends half his week teaching, but a major part of that is theoretical. It is expected of him that he publishes uh, and writes, and is to some extent an intellectual, which is a word we find very difficult in, in England, and I suspect in, in the United States, that, that the, the intellectual, whatever that means, is a very suspect animal, certainly in a school of architecture. I don't agree with this. I think that, that in a sense, architecture is to some, in some ways, a, an intellectual pursuit. I think it, it involves the interaction of ideas and abstractions of ideas, and then the, re, the rebuilding of them back into something that has pragmatic implications. And um, it's difficult. It's difficult if you're just a teacher. Well, to be useful. Mm. In the final analysis, I think that I've just been to some other schools of architecture in the States that are different from this one, where the faculty are academics. They sit up on the campus, and that's what they've done for the last 10, 20 years. And their architecture is frozen, and their architectural opinions are frozen. Well, but you don't fit into that mold by any means. You are constantly growing and mm -hmm. stimulating and thrashing about, and mm -hmm. your activities uh, have continued, uh, I think, to uh, help you to develop all of these years. When, when you look back at those, uh, the early drawings, the early schemes, how do you relate to them? I relate, I almost regard them as somebody else's work. It's very curious that, because I know that in certain places I still have, you know, the primary label around my neck as archigram. And I'm not belittling it, and I think it, it's sort of very important uh, piece of architectural history. On the other hand, I have changed very considerably. I, I think that what I tried to show in the lecture the other night was that certain exploratory aspects and certain traditional attitudes of, of English thinking uh, 
can be fused. And, and, and if you took the first two slides, which was the sort of rhetoric of the Zoom architecture on the one hand, and the misty English bushes on the other hand, um, one might wonder at that point, what the hell have these two things got to do with each other? And then you get to the final project, which is the, the shadow house. And I think what one is saying is that that is to do with the interaction of the two, that the shadow house does not suggest conventional architectural techniques. It suggests very strange combinations of materials and spaces and objects and maybe even mechanics. Um, but used with a kind of English uh, romantic sensibility and attention to very sensitive dealings with space and with substance, which wasn't suggested in the early work. So I would say, yes, if I look back at the early work, it is relatively insensitive. Perhaps it had to be in order to create the rhetorical statement. But um, that also, right the way through, is I think a very strong architectural thread, a thread that is concerned with the manipulation of space, with the organization of things that work, of iconography, you know, clarity of iconography, even when one's talking about shadow house as a sort of misted object, there's a very clear set of icons, set of, set of uh, objects that are then dissolved, that in order to dissolve, and I think that's another common thread, you know, that it's to do with change, movement, disintegration, dissolve, spatial dissolve, and it's still in a sense all the things are related, one has moved simply from a position where one was concerned with replacing objects, now to distorting the concept of space. But it's still, in a sense, a related process. Now, in order for any of those stages in the related process to, to happen, I think you need a point of departure which is very clear, very strong, as I was saying again in the lecture, that uh, it is easier to do it if one starts off from a simple, clear, organizational proposition and then plays it and plays it and plays it until it almost disintegrates and hold it just before it disintegrates. I mean that's a gross oversimplification of what one does. You mentioned the, the Smithsons, mm -hmm. Peter and Alice and Smithson. Were there any other influences on you? Uh, yes, I, I think not in the way that I've met again on this, this tour of, of North America where you meet members of faculty who work with Louis Kahn or work with Walter Gropius or work with Mies or whoever, and then they become like little Kahn's, little Gropius's, little Mies. I don't think one intended to become a little Smithson, and, and uh, there were other influences. I think Buckminster Fuller was an important influence. Uh, I think that somebody called John Killick, who isn't so well known, who was a brilliant teacher who died of, of uh, sclerosis um, was a brilliant uh, teacher and an important architectural influence. Uh, James Gowan, who was the original partner of Sterling, was another of my teachers, very strong influence and still a, a close personal friend. Um, I think that they are all in the role of the kind of empirical, uh, humanist, British, romantic, Puritan, <laughs> if you can combine those things, I think there's a sort of consistent thread running through them. I think that, that one is interested in, in um, a whole train of, of uh, and I'm being English again about it, of, of, of sort of English attitudes, which runs across cultural boundaries. I mean, certainly pertains to certain kinds of writers, certain kinds of dramatists, uh, even perhaps composers, which is to do with the taking of a dogmatic notion, often coming from mainland Europe, and then using a deliberate, almost deliberate uh, inability to sustain, a deliberate kind of low threshold of boredom, whereby the English person starts to play romantically with the idea and distort it distort it and distort it and loosen it and, and, and the inventive thread I think is very strong um, and you can see that in, in English uh, literary narrative where unlike say the French where a, a strong polemic will be established and then the, 
a literary narrative will be dealing with, you know, the process of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or will be dealing with the process of establishing that polemic and using the, the, the dramatis personae to, to, to support that. The English narrative will tend to sort of meander and weave via little episodes. And often, the, at the end of the storyline, there is no conclusion. There is no evil, there is no good, there is no hero, no villain. But a succession of, of observations of different people in different situations, where you're still left seeing several sides of the same personality. And I think what can make a... Uh, a direct architectural connotation with this. I think that the tradition of the picturesque and the tradition of the, the episodic in, in literature are very parallel. I mean, there are dangers with both. Uh, there are dangers of diffusion to confusion, but I think that that, that interests me greatly. And so when I say, when you ask me rather, um, what influences are there? Um, I think that they are to do with a a mood rather than the establishment of a great hero. Nonetheless, you know, one's Corb, Mies and, and, and so on were important. And I think there's always been a sort of curious English distortion of the understanding of Le Corbusier, for instance. Um, and so this leads, when one is designing, not necessarily to discussions of rhetoric. I mean, when Christine and I are designing, we're often talking about books. We're often, we both uh, enjoy reading biographies, not of architectural people, but just of, of, of people in the recent past, so the last half of the century, and discussing the ambiguities of those people. Again, when we discuss our students, we enjoy not to say, you know, Fanny is brilliant and Bert is, is stupid, or wasn't that a good example of that kind of building, but tend we tend, when we're talking privately about them afterwards, tend to discuss the the sort of edges of the thing, the sort of ambiguity of a student who appears, let's say, to be using one set of party, but curiously his psychology has intervened and he can't quite bring it together. And then wasn't it strange that, you know, there's always a lot of sort of, what about if, or isn't it strange that, or perhaps there's another way of looking at it, or let's look, and in, in the way that I was saying in the lecture where we, uh, or maybe I didn't, but, but where one person will start a drawing and the other person will take it over or will draw the thing from another direction. So it is always a question of layering. And, and I would, would make an analogy between this and one's kind of uh, attitude towards designing and one's attitude towards culture, even one's attitude towards teaching, that the process of, of dealing with an issue is not sort of necessarily facing it and saying this is right and this is wrong, so we proceed. It's more a question of saying there are certain uh, sifts which we can put across the issue, certain a priori uh, processes of analysis, and then we don't know where we're going to go. You know, it may be a bit of this and a bit of that and, and things will get distorted. There are dangers. I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of the dangers of this, and I think that, again, um, the usefulness of building is that, of course, in, in the final analysis, you have to stop, and you either put that piece of concrete block there, or you don't. You know, in the final analysis, a concrete block is a concrete block. Even, you know, Californian stud work is, is, is at least pretending to be a solid object. I mean, now that's, if I can just digress on that subject. I find it fascinating that, that, that the majority of Californian architecture is, is, is what I would call cardboard, i.e. It, it, it has all the references to the tradition of solid objects, but in fact it's, it's, it's not a solid object. Uh, although you can argue that in, in the English tradition we used stucco to represent a cheap form of representing marble, you know, as a sort of heroic uh, Italian the idea of the heroic Italian marble but done on the cheap with paint put over brickwork. So you could argue, I suppose, that, that Californian stud work is only one stage removed thereon. But it is fascinating to me that, um, and I don't know whether there's time now to, to explore that fully, but, but, but in a sense the, the example of Hollywood, 
I mean Hollywood representing mm -hmm. the notion of of make believe or only as as much as is necessary to represent represent things is all that you need. That that where is the dividing line then between the Hollywood set and the cardboard house that wants to be a Palladian monument? You know that in fact all of where where does the dividing line lay? Uh, that's an interesting one because I think in Europe we tend to build solidly and we tend therefore by implication to imply permanence um, and intellectually there's a different position so that's a fascinating one that's why I think that you know I, I, I can't believe that I've not come here for the last 12 years I mean it's a, th this trip has been very interesting because can I yes of that? course of course Therapy, which is the differences that have occurred in Los Angeles Twelve years ago, I think Los Angeles was still could still be described as a young city, and therefore did not have obligations. It was a city that just sort of growed. Mm. Now Houston has taken over the role of being the young city that has just growed, and suddenly Los Angeles is an est established old city in a sense. Over yes. the last twelve years, you've seen I that much change. I think there's been a shift. It is. It is discernibly neater, um, it's discernibly being conscious of being metropolitan. It's it's beginning to be a city. I'm not saying it's congealing, but even the, the, the messing about with the downtown, you know, is a sort of is a gesture. It's mm -hmm. important as a gesture. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's organically important to Los Angeles personally. I think that, that the experiment is be, is being uh, missed that Los Angeles really can exist as a polynucleated city, but in fact now there's this sort of joke attempt to make it nucleated, which I, which I'm rather cynical about as an mm. observer. I don't think Los Angeles needs a downtown, but anyhow, if mm -hmm. it wants one, mm -hmm. it can afford one. Well, I think it's it's uh, it's a beginning towards developing a uh, a sort of a center. Yes, but my point is that I don't think it needs it. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it wants to play the game of having a center, that further illustrates my observation that it is conscious of wanting to be like other cities. And I think that, that when one comes towards the discussion of the architectural milieu here, one can see the elements of that as well. It is beginning to want to be identifiable as a certain kind of architectural milieu. It will have its heroes and it will have its villains and it will have its school of thought and it will have its style. I mean, in, in, in uh, Brussels, I, I understand that the Arnibo style in Brussels, which became so developed in Brussels, was almost a self-conscious um, objective on the part of the French-speaking bourgeoisie at the point when Brussels was actually made the capital of Belgium, you know, from the provinces of somewhere else. And that, that, that in order to distinguish it from Paris, you know, where Brussels is always... I mean, one can make another analogy here, which is if Brussels has always been conscious of Paris, you know, in, in cultural terms, it's still treated as a prov provincial element from Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, in the way that I suppose Los Angeles is always going to be conscious of New York. You know, now the uh, outside observer can see this. You know, Los Angeles is a very large city, much larger than most national capitals. I mean, you know, it's five times the size of Vienna after all. It's, it's probably already, you know, two million more than London, etc., etc., etc. But it is still looking over its shoulder to New York. Um, and that's an interesting cultural thing. And, and, and if you then go back to Brussels and say, OK, at that moment, the people of Brussels, the influential people of Brussels, decided upon a sophisticated, rarefied, highly self-conscious style to, to make the statement that they had a city of sophistication and importance and sort of culture writ large in, in, in physical objects. It's quite an interesting notion that, 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 that at least in theory one could have a metropolitan Angelino style which would then say we are a city unlike any other mm. which replaces the notion of it as sort of free fall place with beach huts and, and mm -hmm. uh, I call them beach huts because it, it, coming from the seaside mm -hmm. as I do I'm very interested in the way in which a seaside town is able to be more liberated both habitually and, and physically than 
uh, an inland town. I'm in fact in the process of writing a book where I discuss this and use Los Angeles as part of the uh, illustration of fact. Mm -hmm. That but people, uh, when they go to the sea, when they go, and I suppose when they went west, I mean, you know, Los Angeles was made largely of, of mid Midwesterners who finally made it to the furthest point away from Europe. I mean, I'm interested in that process too. Mm -hmm. that, that and somebody, Easterners. And Easterners. And but, you know, if somebody came, say, from Lithuania, got on a packed sort of steamer, found their way to the east coast of America, found it already crowded with sort of English and Poles and whatever the hell, headed further west, got to Ohio, found it very cold and depressing but made a bit of money, headed even further west. So it's like a double-take dream. The first dream was America. The second dream was where the money was. The third dream is finally the place where you couldn't get any further without going into the sea, you know? And that intrigues me too. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, but, but that's al that's always made Los Angeles a special place. I don't sure. think that's something new. That's no, something but what I'm saying is, if you now we've always had, if you overlay that with an increased consciousness to establish itself, uh, to not be tr treated as a joke, to be treated as a serious metropolitan city, you know, the capital of the West Coast, if you like, these traditional terms. Then it must have a culture. I mean, there was a conversation this afternoon on a jury about the nature of the art gallery as a cultural edifice. And I, <coughs> you know, it, it does run slightly counter to the way in which there's a sort of loose, loose attitude, loose hanging free attitude in, in the West Coast of America where every, you know, it's a very private thing. Now, a proper <coughs> a proper metropolitan city has monuments and has institutions. I mean, this school is an interesting illustration of the point. It is an institution. It gives degrees, it has a curriculum, it must have in order to have its accreditation, and it is in a place which you can mark an X on the spot. But instinctively, it wants to fight it. Now, that fascinates me. Instinctively, it wants to let it hang loose. It doesn't want to be frozen into institutionalism. Nonetheless, it's a factor it is. Now, I can come from a highly institutionalized society where the institutions are so old, like, you know, the British Constitution, which doesn't even exist on paper, uh, like the notion of what is an architect, or like the school that I teach in, which has got, you know, 150 years of believing itself to be free, in fact, being highly hierarchical and highly institutionalized, and even having a chandelier over a certain spot in the floor which has a, a patterned carpet, you know, and you stand there and you're at the centre of the architectural world. And so in a <laughs> sense, once that exists, you don't have to think about it, you see. Once, once, you, once you're very secure about certain things, about monuments, you know, we have so many monuments that we don't know what to do with them. So the last thing a, a, an architect wants to do is to create monuments, but not in a rhetorical sense, like you just don't even bother. Um, I think these, these I've, I've digressed considerably yes. from the discussion of I've noticed grammar. that. Maybe you want to <laughs> pull me back to it. But I was just going to say, shall we uh, return to Peter Cook? Sure. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, you, you've worked with so many talented, interesting mm. people. How have they affected you? Oh, I think very directly. I think I said this uh, again in the lecture, but I could say it more forcibly in a small room, that I have always, I'm arrogant, in the sense that I get very bored working with people who are not as talented as I am, uh, whatever the <laughs> level that may be. I've always worked with people who are more talented than I am. And that means that then you pitch pitch up, you know, this constant sort of slight edginess to how, how you operate. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to work with somebody who, if, if one of you feels sleepy and has a sort of cat nap, you know, for a couple of hours, or if one of you is feeling ill, or one of you is drunk, or one of you is kind of hurt their arm, or, you know, can't get the airbrush to work, or whatever, whatever restrictive element there may be, that you can trust the other person to carry on and probably do something better than you would have done. Um, and also, I think there's the thing of using the editorial process, that you can edit each other's thoughts without it being restrictive editing, it's sort of positive editing. Whatever. Seeing the um, 
idea and then um, instinctively knowing what the instinctively understanding between you know two or however many people uh, what the idea is and and <coughs> when we're designing not really an enormous amount of conversation about the, the thing on the drawing board it, you, you know instantly what the other person's getting at and sometimes we we trade drawings we we one person, as I say, does half the drawing, and the other finishes off the drawing. And you get a, you get two processes. You get an editing process. Uh, on the one hand, pairing away the things that aren't so good, but also you get a cumulative talent thing, which is, you know, two people's ideas better than one, and the thing sort of built up. This is very difficult to achieve. I mean, I can't. I don't think you can perm any two or three moderately talented people and hope that it works it's a temperamental thing as well and it's also a sort of it's to do with jokes as well I can't explain it but um, it's to do with for instance in, in the early archigram days we would oft, often say apropos certain piece of work this will upset them now it's never said who them were mm -hmm. we all understood in, mm -hmm. instinctively who the them were that it would upset it wasn't so much sort of painfully upsetting as kind of this will force them to think. Stir things up Stir a bit. Stir things up. And I think um, working currently um, that with Chris, we, we tend to sort of make a joke of something. There's a sort of sense of humor thing. You make a joke of something, which is a very serious joke. You know, but it's sort of pushing the thing where it it nearly becomes offensive. You know, the actual and, and um, taking this sort of slightly wry, slightly ironic view of of people, which uh, I think is where creativity relates to other aspects of of one's one's personality. You know, it's to do with the sort of ribald way of looking at things. Um, how which about is difficult? How about the drawing? You mm -hmm. know, you're you've always been well known as a beautiful renderer. Mm -hmm. uh, your drawings are admired, especially today. They're more beautiful than ever. How do you feel about that? Well, I think that when I was a student, certainly when I was a very young student, um, I started off before I went to the A in a little local architecture school in my hometown, and even there. I think there were three or four of us who came all in the same year from the same grammar school. Even amongst that very tiny group of people, I was not the best drawer. You know, I was not the best at art. I was moderately interested in these things, but I was not a brilliant, certainly not a very good freehand sketcher. But I think I had some ideas, and I was always determined to communicate, you know, which is probably why I've dabbled in producing magazines and running art galleries well the business of communicating ideas uh, has been primary you know you've got this idea inside you damned if you're not going to get it through somehow which meant one simply forced oneself to draw better and again it's the thing of always having people around one who can draw better than you can you know and you try to keep up with them and then if you're more determined and have more stamina or have more arrogance actually it's an, it's an arrogant element you Maybe you never get quite as good as they are, but you're up there with them. And then after, uh, over a long process of time, you, you uh, acquire tricks, and then you find that, 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 that it's, it's, it's a skill, too. I mean, it's, 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 tra it's a train, what I'm saying, it is a trainable skill, but only by yourself. You have to have the will to do it. I mean, I know my, my graphic limitations. It's just that, that you get cleverer at not exposing them, you know. And also, again, working with other people, I think one of the key people that taught me to draw, let's, let's think of just two or three people. I worked with David Green, who had a way, and has a way of describing three-dimensional objects very lyrically. One of the most lyrical people I think with. Ron Heron is a very important influence. He has a boldness, a clarity of his drawing, of using, you know, we always make a joke about using thick pens, like this, the student saying, well, I think I'll draw that up in the number four. And you say, my God, no, it's going to be at least a number 10. Scale it up 
three any repeater graph sort of three times as a sort of joke. Um, and I think uh, watching people, watching certain students has been extremely important. You know, uh, pitching one's drawings at that, and then latterly sort of pitching one's drawing ability to international figures as you become part of a sort of international circuit of people. You're pitching, you, you've got to be up there with them. You can't let yourself down. And um, Christine Hawley is, again, basically a better drawer than I am, much more lyrical drawer than I am. Uh, and so what one does then is I'm much tougher as a doctrinaire drawer than she is. You see, and then you sort of combine the things. And if you're working with somebody who's, you know, up there, you just have to be, I have to be more lyrical, you know, and she has to be more doctrinaire, and you sort of, it, mm -hmm. it plays off. Mm -hmm. And then when the three of us, when, when Ron, when we did the Don project, the three of us, then you get three e very different drawing abilities. And then we could, virtually, between the three, we didn't have anybody helping us on that scheme at all because we were very arrogant. The three of us can draw almost anything between, <laughs> you know, we certainly don't need anybody helping between the three of us. We cover every conceivable drawing territory, you know, and it, wor it, it moves very fast. And that particular scheme was drawn up in an amazingly short time because you're between three people, com I mean, let, let's say arrogantly, completely confident, you know, you can cover any eventuality. Um, that's a sort of heady situation. We do also have, um, on particularly the competition projects, we have a gang or a, or a coterie or a connection with some very, very good, I mean, we're very lucky because we have friends and usually ex-students or recent stu ex-students, right up to, you know, the immediately previous lot who are, there's some marvellous drawers around in London. I mean, the, the, the level of drawing at the A at the moment is very, very high. Uh, there are a lot of very good drawers of different types, and we can lay hands on, you know, six people at any moment who will help on a project. And that means that, the, you know, even somebody, if you're passing it down the line to somebody helping, the drawing level remains very, very high. Uh, on the on the Carmelita project, we had a Japanese guy and a Polish girl, both recent ex students. One of whom was a very sort of atmospheric drawer, and the other incredibly precise drawer. In both cases, like the girl who was atmospheric, can do atmospheric sort of shadows falling on things and much better than I can. Much better. I have to copy her. And the Japanese guy is a much more accurate drawer than I am. You know, much less impatient. And therefore, I had to keep up with it. He was always questioning us on the plan. He said, you know, do you mean so-and-so, so-and-so? And he was doing drawings to the nearest uh, two centimetres on a scale at one to one to fiftieth, uh, you know, which is an amazing degree of accuracy, like you're moving something like that on a building that's kind of, you know, 500 feet long. And when you get somebody that accurate, you have to think, my God, you know, it really matters whether this piece of concrete is hitting the centre line of a small mallion or the, you know, a centimetre to the left of it. Which is very good. I couldn't do that all the time. And, and, and Chris and I are much less accurate. You know, we, 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 do, we draw very... That's another thing, fast drawing. Because both, um, let's think, of, of people I've worked with, again, Ron Heron and Christine Hawley are very fast, probably faster drawers than I am. I mean, can whistle it out, and therefore I have to be a fast. Mm. And the speed at which is is very in interesting because it forces you to be decisive about decisions taken. You know, well, I'm talking about all these soft things, the things melting and melting. Well. In fact, when it comes to it, you know, we have very few second thoughts when we're actually doing the final drawing. You know exactly, even if we haven't discussed the fine detail, we know exactly what sort of thing we've got to do. You just draw it. You know, and so there is always the thing of the pen running away with the idea. But I don't mind that. I don't, I don't apologise for that. Because I think that there is a certain thing that comes through in the design where there is a fluency. You know, it's, it, if one does the arm movement of that, I mean, there's sort of two ways in which, a, in which a piece of building is described. One is sort of like that, and sort of like that. You see people actually drawing sort of like that, and they're terribly sort of like that. Or there's the sort of thing where it goes, you describe something like that. <laughs>
And <laughs> it's noticeable when we're <laughs> scribbling, and all three of us, uh, you know, that we all teach together, that, that all three of us do a lot of drawing in our tutorials. Uh -huh. I think all of us are drawers, and instead of just sort of sitting there and talking to the student, you actually uh -huh. grab a piece uh -huh. of paper and start drawing for them. Uh -huh. And I notice all three of us do tend to do very fluid, fluid drawings for the students. We don't sort of say it's like that and it's like that. It tends to be, how about, you could do, you could do that. It's a sort of fluent uh -huh. thing. And I guess that, that's, I don't know whether that tells you anything, mm. but it's, to me, it's relevant. We, um, <coughs> I think we're enjoying this period of emphasis on drawing, but do mm -hmm. you think we're getting close to a point where we might be giving it too much importance? Oh, yes. In fact, I would say we've probably gone over the top a year or two back. <laughs> um, it's useful for people like myself because one sells them, and if you're not building enough, uh, you need the money, and <laughs> if someone is prepared... I mean, that's a very pragmatic point, but I mm. make it because it's the honest truth. You know, whilst my drawing can command, command you know, reasonably high prices, it is a form of survival. I think it's a poor ninth best to building. And I think that um, it has gone a bit over the top. I think there is now beginning to be a very dangerous animal. And I saw one example of it this afternoon in a jury, which is the sort of person who can make a very elegant drawing of a building with a few elegant parties. It becomes this virtually graphic design exercise. And the drawing is the manner in the manner of sort of fashionable architect's work. And it's a nice thing to have on the wall. But the building has not gone anywhere near to the level of sophistication of the drawing. And we get very angry about it within the AA even. I mean, the AA now has a very high general drawing level. And you sometimes see work which is crass or boring or illiterate or... Well, boring, you know, not, it's not very interesting as building. I mean, we would, and I think in our particular unit, we tend to emphasize um, the armatures of the architecture rather than the sort of placement of graphic. I mean, although we're all, all three of us teaching are known for doing nice drawing, we're, because we are, again, it's rather analogous to me saying that, you know, in England there are lots of old monuments, so you don't bother about it. We're conscious of the fact that we can draw ourselves. Therefore, that's not what we talk about. You know, we assume it's a nice, mm -hmm. it's a relaxing too. We assume that all our mm -hmm. students can draw. Mm -hmm. well. fact, it's now taken for granted. Uh, out of twenty-three or four students, I think we've only got about two who really can't draw that well. The rest can draw extremely well. I would say better than anything I saw on the wall this afternoon in terms of draftsmanship. Therefore, it's a non-conversation. Don't even bother to have the conversation. You're actually talking much more to do with the... Mm -hmm. We tend, I think, again, to be very strong or very keen with our own students uh, in our unit on the organisational principle, sort of original ways of actually organising a building. Interesting sections, strange devices of circulation, sophisticated circulation, sophisticated wrapping of one thing into another into another, exploding things, developing things, so that the, the plan forms are often quite complex and the sections are often quite complex, you know, and the, and the, and the uh, technologies involved are quite widespread from people who are doing things in bits of stone through to people who are doing things in strange wispy fiberglass and steel things with sort of sleeves and all the rest of it. It's that sort of territory. And it is always assumed that the final drawings will be good, which they usually are. You see, so it's a non-conversation. But generally, I think that there is a, 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 a dangerous parallel between the, the predominance of drawing and the lack of a real architectural culture. I think that in general, make a pessimistic point, which is that architecture is a, a rather low point in the cycle of its development. I think that, that people in 50 years' time will look back on this decade, or wherever we are, as an interregnum. I really think it's waiting for the next real thing mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. and 
playing about with neo historicism mm -hmm. and so on. It's just a I marking quite agree. Time. I qu couldn't it's a agree marking with you time more. operation. Nonetheless, I do enjoy one aspect of it, which is that our present group of students are much more literate than they were 15 years ago. You know, they are r able to read and they are interested in objects and, and aesthetics and um, they can sit and they can write, things like this, which um, the sort of nice old uh, late 60s, early 70s free fall period, where as long as it went bang in the night it was cheerful, I, I couldn't go back to that because um, I think it, it would bore me quite frankly. So I wish they had the literacy and then the invention on top, and I place invention higher than anything else. But by invention, I don't mean things that look like inventions. I mean the business to invent with what you've got. You know, like you take a, a room uh, surfaced in, in fiberboard, and then you begin to do something with it. You know, it's not just the it's not the the kind of significance of the fiberboard, it's what you do with it. I still think that's the essence of it. Quite agree. Quite agree. Some wonderful observations. Um, did you ever consider yourself a technologist? Not really. Um, I think one, one, I wouldn't say played with it, one felt that technology should be involved in architecture. Mm -hmm. And have you evolved to a romantic expressionist? Probably, I think that I'm. Uh, I think I probably am, have always been an art architect. Rather, I mean, I, there's a, there's a sort of funny, ob rather pat observation that I've sometimes made. Again, about typical people who go into doing architecture in England. Come from, or the interesting ones come from two sources: those that nearly became painters, and those that nearly became people who mended cars or made. <laughs> in other words, it's a sort of boffin tradition or the sort of art tradition, mm. you know. Uh, and and I suppose I'm instinctively nearer the art tradition than the boffin tradition. You know, um, I've watched like Dennis Crompton is actually a marvelous person to work with because I've discovered how to put pieces of metal together or how to sleeve a, you know, one material with another or how to the procedure of dismembering a clock and then mending it and reassembling it. One is watched by working with him. But, um, and I think a lot of architecture, the technology of architecture is common sense. You know, I think that's another thing that we don't teach our students enough, which is two things. One is, is common sense, like the analysis of a plan is actually walking yourself through it and seeing what it does, and the common sense of where to put certain things, you know, what space to leave in front of an elevator, or where to put the gentleman's toilet, or, uh -huh. you know, how high to make the ceiling of a uh -huh. concert hall, is uh -huh. actually common sense, uh -huh. you know, then you can substantiate it by all sorts of rules of acoustics, uh -huh. and lighting, and ventilation, and so on. Uh -huh. um, the other thing, I think, is of being able to extrapolate observed places back onto the drawing board, of saying, and we do this amongst ourselves, but it's difficult to teach it. Students find it an odd thing, in a funny way, because it's not abstract. That you say, well, what you could do is put a, a pavilion in front, one like the one in Regent's Park. Or you say, how about a lobby like the one in the, I don't know, Claridge's Hotel? Or how about a, a gate like the one at Paddington Station? Or how about a tower that looks like the one in Boston? You know, or how about a bridge that looks like the one at so and so? And you, you're not saying design it exactly like the bridge at so and so. What you're saying is, in, gen in the terms of the size of it, or the placement of it, or the effect that it has on the adjoining building, or whatever it might be, you know, that, that, that for goodness sake, you go around every. I, I got very offended once, got very angry with my students, when um, about five years ago they were doing a bus station. And about four out of the class put the platform on the wrong side of the bus. Uh, we have the, the bus platform, you know, the, 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 you get off the bus on the left-hand side. 
to us about absurd <laughs> driving principles. But the number of the, and they were English students, who'd put the, 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 uh, the platforms for this bus station on the right hand of the bus, and I said, come on, how, have you travelled on a bus? And all of them had travelled on a bus, and probably travelled daily on a bus. And they hadn't actually thought through. I mean, they hadn't shut their eyes for a moment and pictured what you do getting off the bus. And I find that extraordinary, you know. Discussion with somebody as to how high off the floor to put a window. I mean, I say, well, OK, when you're sitting on the toilet, you know, think what it's <laughs> like. Yeah, just imagine yourself and imagine where the window would be. And most of it is, is, is the ability to, to, to visualise. And the, is, is, is the ability to recall, you know, to recall an example, which is why one finds oneself then making cross, and you know, I, I think that uh, that's something which I think one's become far more aware of in recent years, and leads one to, if, if it's, if you call it romanticism, okay, I, I call it, it being slightly more sensitive, you know, being, and, um, I, I love looking at second-rate, third-rate buildings. I mean, the first, like, you go to Chicago and you have yourself photographed in front of, you know, a Mies van der Rohe building because it's there. But it doesn't interest me tremendously, A, because I'm not that sympathetic to Mies, but B, B because one has seen it in so many books. You go there and it's like it's like, you know, it's just like it looks in the picture. But the second-rate, or you're standing at a bus stop or waiting for somebody to come out of a restaurant or something, and you happen to look across the street at some nothing yet. I mean, even walking walking here this morning from uh, the seafront at Santa Monica, I did not pass any distinguished building. I probably didn't even pass any second-rate building. I mean, they were all third to ninth rate. But <laughs> I, I observed some architectural things. I found it very stimulating architecture. I took a few photographs of all things, you know, because it doesn't have to be great architecture to see. Sometimes when you see somebody not very talented attempting to do something more than usually sophisticated, it's fascinating. You look at it and say, ah, you know, he got the window wrong there. See what he's trying to do there. But he didn't do that. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Oh, what a funny juxtaposition. You make the, it's like listening to a conversation, you know. And it, it actually, as long as you don't fall into the trap of, of, of aping it, you know, it's very <laughs> stimulating for the brain. It's like listening to a quiz or something. I mean, it actually sort of keeps you tuned up to, to use your own analytical processes on, on something mm -hmm. quite ordinary. It also means you're never bored, <coughs> you know. I, I was just going to say that I think your visit here has helped to tune us up a little bit, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend this afternoon talking with you, and hope you'll come back soon. Well, I hope I'll come <laughs> back soon, too. Thank that you. That's on record. <laughs> thank you, thank Peter. You. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I thank you. But was that a long one? Yes, it was a long one. <laughs> I missed, you didn't give me a sign at the first half hour, five minute mark, did you? Well, I guess you didn't hear, yeah, it was. Uh, well, you were shouting half hour. Yeah.